Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the November meeting of the Mountain View Computer Users Group. Today we have a really exciting meeting. There has been so much that has gone on this past month that I'm not even too sure where to start. That's why I have a keynote presentation. First, we'll talk a little bit about the business. I'm going to keep this very short uh, because we have a lot to cover. Uh, Tommy Tech Talks. If you remember last month, there was almost nothing. This month, I had to cut out a majority of it to keep it under three hours <laughs> of just Tommy Tech Talk. Um, and it'll be, I'll bring the update as of this morning. I just, there's a couple things that have happened. I'm not even sure I have it in here. Elon Musk and Twitter, what's going on with him and Meta. We'll get to that. Tips of the month. And we have a lot of great tips this month. Then we're going to have the computer lexicon. And then the presentation, Stopping the Cyber Bad Guys. This was a really interesting presentation to put together to exactly go through and explain how I and the other officers will, will uh, come in and explain to you how they do some of the same things. And then we'll have a very short question and answer period. Okay, we do allow sponsoring. We have two sponsors this month, Marabella Candles, their Christmas selection. And I've said this before, they have really great candles. Um, my other sponsor this month is uh, John Buno, or JB Photo and Video, supplying all your photographic needs. Um, something to consider, one of the big things that I have been doing lately is providing memorial service photos. So if you don't have a recent photo, if you want a recent photo, I can do that also, very inexpensively. Ah, user group business, okay, moving right along, the officers, me, hi, Mike, Hello. Barry, Carolyn, the treasurer, who has our treasurer's report. Yes, we have $1,124.22 in checking and $425.29 in savings for a total of $1,549.51. Okay, that'll keep us going for a couple more months. Thank you. Uh, Jim Emmons, our webmaster, does exist. I saw Jim this past week doing well. Buddy does a really good job on our webpage. Uh, some of resources, mvc.org. Check that at least twice a week for updates of anything that's coming up. And then we have our Facebook presence. And then we have uh, other benefits, online resources, hardware checkout. We have a film slide scanner and a projector, professional consultation discounts. Barry and I both leave a message. Those are our phone numbers. Most of you probably have them memorized by now. You know, speed dial, that is going to become an expression very shortly that no one's going to know what it means. Just like skipping the needle. The what? Skipping a needle. Yeah, skip, yeah. yeah. Yes. Kids, rec kids recognize the song. Oh, do you know that vinyls outsold CDs this last year? My daughter has gone vinyl. She says the sound is so much better. Makes One thing I just got a kick out of, because everybody's always said vinyl is better because you have a warmer tone because of the album. Yeah. I just saw somebody a couple of days ago, a younger person, saying that they like to collect CDs because... They have such a warmer tone than streaming does. <laughs> and then moving right along, membership, $25 per household. That's annually. Uh, September through August, pay annual dues to the treasurer. That's Carolyn. Mail a check. By the way, we'll accept donations above the $25, gladly. Uh, what's coming up next month? Emergency services and mobile devices. As we get older, this becomes more and more important. And we'll be discussing all about that next month. Then in January, you in the cloud. February's backups. And then March is going to be Microsoft. April, email services, podcast, blogging. May is going to be password management. July has been repeated. August is going to be fun is the future. What has changed dramatically? And this year looks like it's going to be really interesting. But let's move into... This month has been amazing for what's happened. Um, Apple introduced macOS Ventura. If you own a Macintosh, please download Ventura. Please. It is the best update they have made in years. There is so much new to it that we cannot devote one meeting to it. So we're going to be doing it every month. We're going to give you more and more about what's coming on. It is made using the um, Mac a whole new experience. Loving every minute of it. Also, they released iPad OS. The iPhone OS was released last month. The iPad OS was released this month. And 
once again, it contains iPad OS takes a marked departure from the iPhone OS. While they are similar, there are a lot of differences, and we'll be talking about those going through. If you own an iPad and it can support OS 16, do yourself a favor and download it. Um, it it's been a delight to use it. More news. Apple earnings were well above projection. Apple rose $10 in one day. And then if you ever follow the stock market, the next day an analyst questions that he doesn't agree with the App Store earnings. The stock drops $5 a share. It has been on a roller coaster this entire month, changing most days $5 to $6 a day up and down. Now, Elon Musk buys Twitter. All hell is breaking loose. He fired 11,000 employees. Um, he has uh, gone in and curtailed what people can say. Oh, he is hiring back the ones that he just discovered are indispensable. <laughs> yeah. The ones that actually can do uh, something. Implement the stuff he wants change. Um, right now, the CEOs, <clears throat> Facebook, Meta, Meta, the company that was formed from Facebook with Zuckerman, is failing. Big time. Its stock dropped 31% in one day. They can't do the things they said they were going to do. If you own Facebook stock, I'm sorry to tell you, it is now worthless. And that's not coming from me. That is coming from the brokerage houses. Um, he also released 11,000 people in one day. There's also big discussions about work from home. All the studies have shown that a company is more productive working from home. Unfortunately, there's a number of CEOs out there that don't believe it. One of the things that, other things that Elon Musk... Uh... It's getting rid of. Send it. Yeah, he's yes. call, calling everybody back to everybody will come in for 40 hours. Um, it should be interesting. He has to personally improve any. Um, he'll be busy. <laughs> the Apple V. Almost every day there is something about the Apple VR and AR headsets. Apple has acknowledged that it exists. They have not given a release date. But those who think they are in the know are saying we're going to get the the actual announcement at WWDC in June. The headset will be announced at that point, and the glasses will come in 2024. I have seen some very, what I consider to be reliable projections on the glasses. If the glasses are half of what I am seeing, it is going to completely revolutionize the way we interact with our computers and interact with our optometrist. Imagine having a pair of glasses whose prescription you can change on the go. Right now, I have to have three pairs of glasses. I have to driving glasses, reading glasses, and computer glasses. If Apple has done what people are saying they're done, I will be able to change that prescription and the glasses will change to match it. Maybe through a focus mode, that would be... Yes. Okay, so that's where we are. Are there any questions? That's, that's just... Do we have any questions about MVCUG or Tommy Tech Talks? If we don't, we'll move right along. We've got a lot going this month, okay? Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is a presentation that Barry did Um last month that we weren't able to yeah and we weren't able to see it it's about the traffic lights on mac os we'll take a look at that right now hi it's barry midgordon back again for a mac os tip that i call traffic lights to close minimize or go full screen that is the question so what do i mean by traffic lights well it's not really a mac os feature called traffic lights it's just that in every single window on the Mac OS, well, almost every single one, you'll find three buttons, a red, yellow, and green circle in the upper left corner. Let's take a look and see what they do. It's basic window interface controls. So here I am in the Finder. I'm going to uh, say New Finder Window from the File menu. This is just a window that it represents my home directory on my Macintosh. And you'll see up here in the top, left corner of the window three circles a red yellow and green they're each buttons if you hover over them you'll get an overlay an x in the red one a minus sign or a horizontal line in the yellow and a green one two little arrows pointing outwards if you point to it directly it's also a drop down menu with some options look at those in a minute so what do these three colored buttons do well red X gets rid of it or closes it in the Macintosh vernacular. So let's create another new folder. I used the keyboard shortcut that time, 
New Finder Window, Command N. So X closes, the yellow button minus minimizes. And you'll notice that it puts it right down here on the dock. It puts a miniature version of the icon and it has a little tiny uh, indication of the app that it is associated with. So the little finder icon on the corner of the window. The finder icon refers to the finder application, which is also on the dock. A little dot underneath it means it's running. The finder is always running as long as the Mac operating system is up and running and the computer is on, unless there's something malfunctioning. So yellow minimizes, puts it on the dock, gets it off the screen for you. It's a neat little uh, animation there they call the genie effect. And then the green button, just for clicking, does this first item in the menu, enter full screen. And it takes the window to encompass the entire screen. And you'll notice that the menu bar at the top and the dock at the bottom go away. They're actually just hidden. They're really still there. All you gotta do is move the mouse or the pointer to the top of the window, uh, uh, screen, in your, I mean, and it shows the menu bar. Move the pointer to the bottom and it'll show the dock. So anytime you're in full screen, those elements are hidden, but they're still there to be used. All you got to do is move the mouse to that place. And if you go to the top, you can get back to those three buttons. You can't minimize from full screen, but you can exit full screen by clicking that green button again. So three ways of dealing with windows, closing them, minimizing them, and going full screen. Let's say I've got a couple more finder windows open here. They're all just going to show the same thing because that's what the default is for my new windows, show my home. And if I click on the close button, one of them goes away. But what if I want all of them to go away at the same time? I can hold down the option key on the keyboard, click on the X, and it, it will close all windows. Let's look at where that is in the menu. You can close a window from the file menu and there's still two left. If I hold the option key down and go back to the file menu, you'll notice that it adds it to the keyboard shortcut and it says now close all. All of them go away. So similar action happens when you use the close button one at a time or hold the option key down and everything goes in. If you click on one of them with the option key in the dock, it brings them all back open again. So that command is in the window menu. Minimize does one. Option window command minimizes all. Keyboard shortcut, option command M. So what does the option key do with the full screen button? Well, you'll notice in the menu, there's also tile window to the left and tile window to the right. If you tile a window to the left side of the screen, you go into split screen mode. And then you can choose any other open visible window that you see on the other side and make it full screen on the other half of your screen. And there's a bar in the middle in which you can change the uh, proportions of each side. This looks kind of silly because it's the same thing on both sides. But imagine as if uh, one of these is not the finder window. But let's go look at a couple of other options here. Let's close the finder. Let's open a pages document and let's open a web browser and I've got Safari open here and let's take Safari and go tile window to the left of the screen and then I can click on the pages document and now I've got browser on one side and a word processor on the other and if I'm referring to something on the browser that I need to research or just copy and paste or whatever I can with both of them in full screen mode. If you take one of them out of full screen mode, the other one is left in full screen mode in another space. So if you do the option key, the tiling changes to move so that you can just zoom the window and make the window go to the half of the screen that you, where is the menu? There we go, move to the right side of the screen. So it's very similar to split screen, full screen, but they're still independent floating windows. They just are automatically sized to fit in between the menu bar and the dock on the left or the right. You can't change the proportions of both of them at the same time. You can, you know, change the size of one window and then the other window independently, but they're just floating windows. Zooming, oops, I didn't want to go to full screen, sorry. Zooming the window just makes it a as big 
as it needs to be to show you, in this case, one page of the uh, pages document. If we were to go to the finder and open another new window, if we zoomed it, it would change the size and aspect ratio of the window to fit just what you can see in that window in the finder. You notice it got smaller instead of getting bigger. If I click it again, it just readjusts. It doesn't go back to the way it was before. So if I go make it really big and then go zoom, it just makes it take up only enough uh, screens real estate to show you the contents. So there's a better way to deal with getting windows out of the way so you can see other content, however, than minimizing. Minimizing requires you to either use the command in the in the menu bar, so you gotta move the mouse, click and choose, or use the keyboard shortcut, which isn't too bad, but still means if you wanna see that window again, you've gotta move the mouse and you gotta click here. What you can do instead is hide an application. So you'll notice in the Finder application itself, in the application menu, every application running has its own menu next to the Apple menu. There is a command in almost every single app on the Mac called Hide, in this case Hide Finder. So it's going to make the Finder window disappear. It's not minimized, it's not in the dock, it's just hidden from view and it gives you easy access to anything that was underneath it. I can do the same thing with Pages, Hide Pages. And now I've got three apps still open. Got the Finder open, it's hidden. You see how it's, how it's uh, grayed out a little bit. Pages is open. It's also kind of faded. And Safari is open, and it's right here. Instead of minimizing and doing all those mouse clickings or menu commands, simply hide it, and it also has a keyboard shortcut. If you add the Option key to the Hide command, you will hide others. So if there are other windows, let's bring all these back. Let's just clutter my screen up with all kinds of windows that are supposed to be, or that were hidden before. And let's say I want to hide everything but this Finder window. Finder, Hide Others, or Option Command H, if I use the keyboard shortcut, now it hides everything else and leaves my Finder window visible. The other ones are still there, they're just hidden from view. And the easiest way to get one of them back at a time is to use the app switcher. Hold the tab key down, or the command key down, hit the tab key, and then hit the tab key again to advance the switcher selection to the app you want, and then release that app becomes visible. So. You may have noticed, if you've been using the close button to close a document, to close a window, that sometimes it behaves differently with uh, different applications. For instance, if I open the Contacts app and, let's say, System Preferences, we, they each have a close button and a minimize button. You can minimize the System Preferences app. You can minimize the Contacts app. You can even go full screen with the Contacts app. However, if you were to click the red button to close that window, you'll notice, watch in the menu bar up here, Contacts, it goes away. And it's no longer running because there's not a dot underneath it in the... Some application, some windows, will actually quit the application when you hit the Close button. And some of them won't. For instance, your Safari, if I close the Safari window, it's going to ask me, it's okay, I can close that. Safari's still running. It's still in the menu bar. And I can open a new window, new window, or I can go to history and go to recently closed, open one that I had before. There is some logic to this. The Contacts app is a one window app. If you close that main window, it won't go, or it'll go away completely. Contacts will quit. Same with system preferences. It's all in one window. If you, to look at different things, you're looking at these different preference panes, these different bits of settings for your Mac, but it's all still in the same window. So closing the window quits the app. However, in Pages, if you've got another app, another window open, let's uh, put in some text here so you can see something. You've got this window open, you've got uh, this window open. You close one of them, the uh, software is assuming 
you still want to work with the other one. And even if you close all of them, it's going to ask me if I want to save it. No, I don't need to save that. It's still open because it assumes that you're knowing that you still want to work with pages. Now, if you don't want to work with pages again in the near future, then you would have to go to the pages menu and choose quit or use the keyboard command, command Q. And then pages completely is flushed from the memory of the computer. That's why the red button sometimes quits and sometimes just closes the window because if it's a multi-window app, it thinks, okay, you could still be using the other window or make a new window. So I'll leave the app running. Some apps, once you close that window, there's nothing else you do with it. So it just quits for you. And that's Mac OS traffic lights. Hope this was helpful. Tune in for another Mac OS tip next month. I want you to understand this was not, this happened by accident because the next two things we're going to be talking about are related to Windows management. No, not yet. Okay, the next one, but we're going to be talking about Windows management coming up to show you how much has changed just in the time from when Barry made that to now. All of what he said is still valid. A lot has been added to make it much easier to maneuver on the desktop in between applications. Something I did forget to mention on why on using the iPhone and camera continuity. One thing that you can do now in FaceTime, if you've ever used FaceTime trying to keep yourself centered in the uh, picture when you're talking on FaceTime or in Zoom, using an iPhone from 12 forward with the portrait mode, it centers it for you. So regardless of where you move within the picture, it keeps you centered as long as it's in a reasonable field of view. That alone makes it worth using. You don't have to worry about it. Plus, it naturally blurs the background, not as much as I want it to, but it does that. We're looking uh, here shortly. You'll be able to uh, change backgrounds like you've seen in Zoom, which the reason Apple hasn't done it yet is because they haven't gotten to the point where they feel it's an Apple product, but that is coming. So the next thing we're going to be talking about, Mac OS Ventura. It's a video I have on the seven major changes. There are over 500 changes in Ventura. Some of them major, some of them very minor. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about different new features. So these are the seven major ones. I strongly urge if you have a Mac and it can be upgraded to Ventura. I know Barry and I have been using it now for almost a month. I'm loving it. Now, one thing I am I want to cover right now because I'm thinking about it. Many of us coming up through computer times have a desktop and a laptop because you really needed it. I'm telling you now with Mac Silicon, I am a power user. Max out using my Mac. I do a lot of video. I do a lot of audio. I do a lot of photographs. I have one computer now. It's my laptop. When I'm at home, I put it in its docking station, which is back behind the screen. I have a keyboard and a mouse, and I've got a desktop. I can take this into my living room. I can put it up on the TV screen using AirPlay, and I can use it as a to watch movies with. There's a number of different reasons. If I go on a trip, it's the same computer. I'm not having to keep everything updated. So unless you are really into heavyweight graphics, doing 4K plus video editing of over two, mile, two um, hours in duration, you don't need a desktop, just a laptop. Okay, let's take a look at this video. By the way, the if I can find a video that does a better job of presenting something, I'll do it instead of me doing it. And the ones I have today, they do a much better job than I can do. So let's take a look at the seven design changes. Hi, this is Gary with MacMost.com. Let's take a look at what Apple redesigned for Mac OS Ventura. MacMost is brought to you thanks to a great group of more than a thousand supporters. Go to MacMost.com slash Patreon. There you could read more about the Patreon campaign. Join us and get exclusive content and course discounts. So in addition to adding new features and apps for macOS Ventura, Apple also redesigned some parts of macOS. Now nowhere is this more apparent than the System Settings app. In System Preferences in Monterey, things look pretty much like they have for years. But with Ventura comes a complete redesign of this app and it's now called System Settings. And you can see how it looks very different with topics on the left, settings on the right. And I have a whole video on what's changed between System Preferences and System Settings. So I won't go into this too much. But nowhere is this more apparent than if you look at someplace like Wallpaper which is a whole new section here. It used to be called Desktop Background. 
and it used to be combined with Screen Saver and it used to look very different than this. But all the same functionality is there. It's just a new design. It's much more of a list view where you can scroll through all of your options and all the controls are much more modern. But besides system settings what else has changed? Well one of the things that you may notice if you ever print is when you go to File both Page Setup and Print are different. So in Monterey Page Setup looked like this. But now in Ventura it has a redesign and it looks like this. There's not that much here in Page Setup in most cases so it's going to be pretty easy to make the adjustment. Print however used to look like this in Monterey and it's looked pretty much the same for a long time. But now in Ventura it looks like this. And you can see here on the left you've got a list of all of the pages that will print. And the controls here to the right they have a list view as well. You've got the main settings here at the top. They don't scroll. And you've got your printer and your presets as before. But now all of these controls scroll. So if you want to get to something you may have to scroll down and then open up the section here to get to it. But what's nice is it's not hard to see what's there. For instance a lot of times before I would tell people to go to Layout and in Monterey and before you would have to actually choose from a pop-up menu layout. You wouldn't see it there unless you knew which menu to activate to get to it. But now you could see everything and if I say go to layout you can see where that is. Another thing that's changed is the About This Mac window. Here's what it looked like in Monterey. Now in Ventura it's simplified a little bit. You get the basic information there but you don't really have much more you can do except go to More Info. And More Info is going to take you inside of System Settings. Notice how it launched System Settings here. And then into General and into About inside of General. And this is where you'll continue to find more information and be able to get details, be able to go to the Storage Manager here and get to the System Report. Note you can still choose the Apple menu and hold the Option key down to go right to the System Information app. Now depending on what you do you may never have used the Fontbook app on your Mac or you may use it all the time. Well it finally gets a redesign. I don't know if it's been redesigned since the earliest days of Mac OS X. So here's what it used to look like. But now it takes on a much more modern appearance with a regular sidebar here on the left. And notice how you get little previews of all the fonts in the list. So it's a little easier to choose a font that you want to see. And this is just the grid view. If you go to List View you actually get a better view of all the fonts. And in some of these you can expand and see all the variations. Now Spotlight kind of looks the same but there's been some fundamental design changes. Most notably in Monterey and before if you would go to a file that you would find in the list you could press Tab and get a preview of it right there in the Spotlight window. Now in Spotlight you can't get a preview of a document inside the window. But as a replacement you can now use Quick Look. So I've selected this file here in the results. If I press the space bar it opens up the Quick Look window. If you've grown used to seeing previews inside Spotlight you're probably not going to like this change. But if you're one of the people that wanted to have Quick Look integrated with Spotlight then you're probably pretty happy. Now Siri looks a little different as well. The results show up a little differently. Like in Monterey this is what you would get as a result. And now in Ventura what's 6 times 9? It's 54. Also redesigned is the Share Sheet. So if you wanted to share a web page say here in Safari you would click the Share button up here and you could see that it looks a little different. It now has a little bubble shape instead of a menu shape. You also get a list of people that you frequently share things with here so you can quickly share it with them. This makes it work a lot more like sharing in iOS. And here if I want to share a file I can click there and you can see the new share sheet there as well. So there's some design changes to look out for in macOS Ventura. Thanks for watching. Okay, those are the seven major changes. A couple things. System settings. Not real happy with it. I don't like it. Mainly because a lot of the things that were there before you can't find. I have programs that have to have permissions to do things and I can't change the permission. It won't let me. Problem is is that some vendors out there, Western Digital in particular, I do not recommend Western Digital drives anymore. They used to be my favorite drive. However, their customer support has gotten so bad I cannot recommend them. They do not read trouble tickets. What they do is they see the subject and they respond back with a pat answer rather than dealing with the actual problem. The printer dialog is a welcome change. However, 
Not all vendors support it. If the application you're using uses a custom designed printer dialog, you will not get these new features. Adobe is the most notorious. The other thing is, you notice you talked about the share menu? Some of the Apple applications don't got rid of share and they've replaced it with collaboration, which is similar but not the same. How I found this out is this morning a friend of mine, just before the meeting started, saying he's in Keynote. He used to share his Keynote presentation. It's not there. How does he do it? It's now called collaboration. So those are some of the changes. We'll be covering more tips and tricks on Mac OS, but the big, big change is coming up next. And it's two different videos showing something which is almost identical. It's called Stage Manager. For years, we've been complaining about Windows management, and especially on iOS, iPad specifically. Apple has come up with a solution that is just short of miraculous. I love it. For Apple to actually come up and listen to what we've been saying, there is so much built into it. I was going to do the video myself, and I came across these two videos, and I said, hey, this guy's done, he's hitting stuff that I didn't even know existed in it. So we're going to take a look at it. This feature alone, if you use nothing else in, I, in Mac OS Ventura and I, uh, iPad OS 16, this is worth upgrading for it. An amazing achievement, I think. So let's take a look at Stage Manager on Mac OS. With Stage Manager on Mac, you can easily move between tasks while keeping the focus on what's in front of you. Here's how, starting in Mac OS Ventura. First, click Control Center in the top right corner of your screen. There will be a button to turn Stage Manager on or off. Click it and Stage Manager will automatically arrange your recently used apps to the side of your screen and put the one you're working on at the center. Click a different app to bring it to the center instead. When you're using an app with multiple open windows, Stage Manager will gather them into a single stack. Click the stack to view the top window and click the stack again to select a different window. When you click an app icon, a preview of all open windows will be displayed to the side so you can review them at a glance. Click the one you want to use to bring it to the center. You can also have overlapping windows and multiple apps open at the same time. To group apps together, drag one window to the center to pair it with another. You can create multiple app groupings and have as many windows in a group as you'd like. Click anywhere on your desktop and Stage Manager will move out of the way so you can access files and even drag them into open windows in Stage Manager. Ah, oh, congratulations, Leo. And that's how Stage Manager helps you to be more productive and organized. To learn more about how to use your Mac, subscribe to our Apple Support YouTube channel or click another video to keep watching. Okay, strange they did that. My return button's not going back to where it's supposed to be. Okay, that video, by the way, is a YouTube video on the Apple Support channel. If you don't subscribe to that one, you own an Apple product, you really should reconsider. It's a great channel to go up. They have all kinds of tips and tricks. Now, that was the Mac. Now, one of the nice frustrations for me before is, that, you know, the Mac has got multiple screens. It has virtual screens. Trying to keep organized because I'll have a lot of applications open at one time. I could never remember what screen something went on. Since Stage Manager, I have stopped using screens. I, I do occasionally, but not like I did before because Stage Manager keeps everything organized for me. I have multiple groups set up. So my workflow, like when I'm browsing the web, I like to have my notes application open at the same time to take notes. I just click on it and does it all automatically for me. Now, let's take a look at Stage Manager on iOS. If you own an iPad, this is what you get. In my recent video where I detailed nine new features in iPad OS 16, I mentioned Stage Manager. And at the time I explained that it was too complicated to cover everything in that video and would need a dedicated video. Well, here's that dedicated video. Stick with me as I show you everything that Stage Manager can now do on the iPad. 
Before we get fully into the video, it is important to mention that not all iPads will be able to run Stage Manager. You'll need either an iPad Air 5th generation, an iPad Pro 12.9 inch 3rd generation or later, or an iPad Pro 11 inch 1st generation or later. I'm currently running this on my iPad 11 inch 2nd generation, and if you're unsure about what kind of iPad you're using, open Settings, then tap on General, then About, and look here, Model Name. Unfortunately, if you've got an iPad that isn't compatible, this feature will not be available on your iPad. But keep watching. Maybe by the end of this video, you'll like the feature enough to consider an upgrade. According to Apple, Stage Manager is their brand new solution for multitasking on the iPad. If you've been an iPad owner for a while, you'll likely know that multitasking is the one thing that Apple have really struggled to get to grips with here on the iPad. The previous multitasking methods have always been a bit clunky or failed to really make the most of what is potentially quite a small display, especially when compared with a MacBook or a desktop Mac. Stage Manager does go some way to making the multitask experience on the iPad better. It's not perfect, but it's good, albeit kind of confusing at first, so let me walk you through it. Okay, so first up, we need to enable Stage Manager. To do this, head into Settings, then choose Home Screen and Multitasking, and toggle on Use Stage Manager on iPad. Beneath that, we've got this layout section with two toggle options that aren't all that obvious. I would recommend that you play around with these and find a setup that works for you. Recent apps is the strip on the left of the screen that gives you quick access to apps that you've got open. We'll talk more about that in this video. And the dock is the dock, just like you've always had on your iPad. Apple don't really explain how this works especially well in my opinion, but from what I've worked out by using the feature, if you toggle on recent apps, for example, the recent apps tab can remain visible while you've got other apps open. If you toggle it off, you can still access the Recent Apps tab by swiping from left to right with an app open, but when you then select another app, the tab will disappear. It works the same with the dock, so it really is a case of you trying them both out and seeing which one you prefer. I'm going to leave them toggled on for the rest of this video. Oh, and something else worth doing is ensuring that you can access Stage Manager from Control Center. Go into Settings, then Control Center, and then scroll down to the More Controls section. In here, there will be a Stage Manager option. Tapping the little green plus next to that, we'll then move Stage Manager into our Control Center, and we can then come out of Settings, open Control Center, and tap this button to enable Stage Manager. When you first enable it, it's not obvious that you've enabled it, as nothing really happens on the main screen, but once we start opening up apps, you'll start to see the change take effect. So, let's start by opening up Safari. You can see that, at first, nothing looks particularly different, but notice this little icon down in the bottom right corner at the edge of the display. This is a feature of Stage Manager, and if I tap and drag here, I can resize this Safari window. At its most basic, this is how Stage Manager works. I've now got an app that takes up most of the display, enough of it to be fully functional, but I've still got full access to my dock down at the bottom of the screen. So let's also open another app. I'll tap into the app gallery and I'm gonna open Podcasts. See how the Podcasts app has opened in the same space that Safari was just in, but Safari has switched over to the left of the display. This over here on the left is known as a thumbnail and at its most basic, I can tap on the thumbnail for Safari to swap apps out. Notice that when I do that, Podcasts moves over to where Safari was. But if I want, I can use that resize tool to make more changes. So I could make Safari even smaller, albeit still entirely functional, and then I could drag podcasts from the thumbnail over here on the left and drag it onto the screen along with Safari. So now I've got both Safari and podcasts open in the same main window, and I can easily tap to move between the two apps. Apple are referring to this as a workspace, although I'd have thought they would have referred to it as a stage, but never mind. And the idea is that each workspace can be personal to you based on how you like to work. So perhaps you tend to write in notes and you want to use Safari for research at the same time. You could in theory position notes to give you enough space to be able to type out your document whilst also having visibility of Safari. But then where it gets really interesting is if I then open another app. So I'm going to open Calm and see how the new app opens while my previous workspace, which consisted of Safari and Podcasts, gets moved to its own thumbnail together on the left of the screen. 
So again, at its most basic level, I can bounce between the thumbnails, bouncing from the car map, which is currently by itself, into the workspace that I've just created that consists of Safari and podcasts. Notice that each window has three dots up at the top of it. If you tap and hold on that, you can then use that to drag windows around a little. And whilst it isn't as fluid as doing so on a Mac, it does allow you a certain degree of being able to position windows across your workspace. But if you simply tap on these three dots, you've got some options. You can make an app go full screen, which is kind of what we're used to on the iPad or you can add another window to the current workspace. If you tap on this, the open windows in your current workspace will kind of move to the side, allowing you to either access another app by selecting something from the dock or from the app gallery down here at the bottom of the screen, or by selecting any of the apps that you've got open in other workspaces. So if I tap on Calm, that app now joins the other two apps that I've got in this workspace. I'm then gonna do some positioning to get this workspace looking how I like it, using a mixture of the three dots menu up at the top to drag windows around, and the little resize icon in the bottom right for resizing. But then let me show you what happens if I then go to the app gallery and open another app. For the sake of this, I'll open YouTube. YouTube opens in its own workspace as expected, and the three other open apps have now bounced to a thumbnail over here on the left. And again, you can bounce between the workspaces, jumping from the one with YouTube to the one with three apps and vice versa. And I guess this is kind of the point of Stage Manager. You can use it the way that you're comfortable with, taking advantage of it as much or as little as you like. If you wanna use it to bounce between open apps very easily whilst only sacrificing a small amount of screen real estate, you can. If you wanna create stages or workspaces with multiple apps that you like using together at the same time and bounce between those, or mix and match with those two functions, you can. Or you can, of course, choose to not use it at all if you'd prefer. It takes some getting used to, but I actually quite like it, even on my 11-inch iPad Pro, which is a really small screen, all things considered. It does work pretty well. I'll probably use it for bouncing between apps more than anything else, but there are situations where I can see myself using it with multiple apps open in the same workspace. Finally, if you wanna close down a window, tap on the three dots and choose Close Window. If you swipe up from the bottom of the screen and hold for a second, you can see all open apps and workspaces and can access one by tapping on it here. And then if you have multiple instances of an app open, like multiple Safari windows, for example, tap and hold on the app icon. So down here in the dock, for example, and choose show all windows. You can then of course start closing down windows if you wish. Oh, and you can make use of this with an external display, although the full capabilities of that, where you can essentially use your iPad like you would a MacBook and have your external display as a fully fledged external monitor is only available on the iPad Pro with M1 or M2 chip, sadly. So not something I can test out at this time. It's also not available until later on in the year. But when it arrives, if you happen to try it out, drop me a comment and let me know what you think of it. I'd love to get your opinion on whether the iPad has truly reached laptop replacement standard with this new update. So there you go, that's Stage Manager on the iPad explained. It's a bold change by Apple and some people are going to absolutely hate it. I think some people are going to really like it and I guess a number of people are gonna to be totally disinterested. Which category do you fit into? Is this something you'll use? drop me a comment and let me know. Oh, and by the way, if you're enjoying the content here, why not consider signing up to my newsletter, The Proper Weekly? I include some tech news, a behind the scenes of what's happening here on the channel, as well as a tip for a product in the Apple ecosystem. The newsletter goes out each Friday, it's free to sign up, and I'll include the sign up link in the description of this video. And as ever, if you found this video useful, do please consider leaving me a like and subscribing to my channel for more content like this in the future. See you on the next video. So that is Stage Manager on the iPad. Very similar to the way it works on Mac OS. He brought up an interesting point I just want to touch base on. Has the iPad become the new laptop replacement? Is it a fully functional laptop? Not really. But depending upon what you do, I just realized right now that I use my laptop as my desktop and I use my iPad as my laptop um, because this is a lot smaller, a lot more portable, and it does 90% of what I want it to do. Is this one faster? Yes, a lot faster, but only in things that I need the speed. Um, so if you feel compelled to have a desktop and a laptop, the MacBook, laptop, 
and an iPad. You get the best of both worlds. So um, the other thing I want to talk about right now, and we're, we're not demoing this today. I just want to make you aware that it exists because if you have a need for it, it's great. Apple introduced on iPad a program called Freeform. It's available on the phone and iPad. It is a collaboration tool. Yeah, it's on the phone. E eventually. Yeah, eventually. It's not available right now. It's a collaboration. It's a whiteboard. If you've ever used the whiteboard in Zoom or in Teams, it works very similar to that, but a lot more versatile. We will be doing a demonstration of it in an upcoming probably when they introduce the Mac version of it. I've also been told that they're going to release a Windows version of it, which should be very, very interesting. If you're familiar with Notes, imagine a Notes page on steroids. That's kind of what it is. One of the things, have you tried it free for me, Barry? No, because it's only in the beta. On the Mac, yeah. It's no, been... The iPad, iPad OS, it's only in the beta for 16.2. Uh, oh, okay. Um, well, one thing I have discovered that I use it for is that I will design a document and then print it out as a PDF and put it in notes because when it's in PDF form, all the hyperlinks become active. So I can design these incredible pages. I can put drawings in there, hyperlinks, handwritten text. It's a really well done tool, but I question how many people will be, will be using it. Apple thinks quite a bit because there have been a lot of in collaboration. We have infinite canvas brainstorming tool for collaboration. Yes. For multiple people to do the work on yes. at the same time. And we'll be showing you what that's like. Mike, I know you've got something on Windows Update. All right, guys, this is going to be kind of short and sweet. I just wanted to talk a little bit about Windows Update news. Uh, Talk about being the exact opposite of what Apple goes through with uh, extreme detailed information on what they're coming out with. Windows, Microsoft Windows, is going in the opposite direction and it's getting very frustrating for a lot of the pundits that follow it. What they're doing is they are trickling out updates with very little fanfare. Apparently the only place they're actually announcing any of the updates that they're doing or what the content is is on the president of Microsoft's blog on the Microsoft website. They're not advertising it. They're not doing any kind of announcements. Uh, they are just announcing it there. They are trickling out uh, feature updates. And even that is all up in the air. Uh, they are still sticking kind of, sort of, with uh, Patch Tuesday being the second Tuesday. But that's not really written in stone anymore. Basically, the updates come out when are ready to uh, put some of them out. Uh, there are different updates for Windows 10 and and different ones for Windows 11. The updates I've seen in the last couple of months are basically just cosmetic, uh, some minor changes to the start menu, uh, really. The one thing that everybody has been looking forward to is getting tabbed view in File Explorer, and that supposedly was going to come out uh, with a major update uh, this fall, and it has not been part of that yet, so apparently they're running into issues with that. Yeah, Barry? Is that gonna be Windows 10 as well, or just 11? Windows 11 was supposed to have it uh, in September, and then it was, Windows 10 was supposed to get it in October. As far as I know, it hasn't dropped yet. So, like I said, they're still kind of doing uh, second patch Tuesdays. You're getting some. Uh, the fourth Tuesday, you, you may be getting some other things, uh, but it's really iffy. Uh, apparently, one thing that was kind of mentioned is that they're probably still going to do a really major update uh, every three years, although they're not saying, well, will that be Windows 12? They're not saying, but apparently they want to do some kind of major product rollout every three years. Uh, the last couple of years, what they were doing was uh, in the spring and the fall, they were going to do updates, and they're apparently abandoning that. They're going to do one major update once once a year uh, at their discretion. So all that's really kind of up in the air, and that's why I'm really not doing much with uh, new Windows features because it's kind of hard to see what's out there. Right? Uh, I'm going to try to follow the blogs and uh, get a better handle for what's going on. Uh, that's the way it is right now. All righty, John. Thank you very much, Mike. Now we have one more presentation. Okay, we're back from the break now. And one thing I want to talk about before we go into Barry's presentation is something that, if you know people do video, I now have my new iPhone 16. It has the 14, rather. <laughs> iPhone 14 running iOS 16. You meant the future? You have a time machine? The iPhone 14. <laughs> the new action setting, which is a stabilized function, works better than what Apple said it does. I've been experimenting with it, and most of you realize I walk with a noticeable limp these days. I've taken my phone, hand-holding it without my cane, and it is rock-solid steady. If you look very closely, 
you can see a little bit of movement. Not noticeable enough unless you are really studying it. Now, I did do one without the stabilization to see the difference. And while on the phone, it's not that noticeable. When you project it on the large screen TV, it is. The stabilize. So if you know anybody who's doing video, this is the most affordable video cam 4K video camera you're going to find by a long shot. Because that stabilization feature normally requires an expensive gimbal. And I had a friend of mine who's much younger than I take and was running with it. Always like this and running. And I hope to have those videos available pretty soon. And it was rock solid stable. I could not believe it. Because even my gimbal is not that good. So just want to talk about that. And Barry's going to talk about Postable, and let's see if we can do the screen share now. So, all right, so this is uh, not a tip, it's not a trick, it's not uh, a how-to, um, it's just a, a favorite that I've come across recently, something I, uh, that uh, I'd like to share uh, coming up into this uh, holiday season. Uh, how many remember when you went to Hallmark when you cared enough to send the very best? <laughs> Still do. <laughs> Still do, yeah. Well, uh, and that's, that's great. Um, and you can go to their stores. Uh, a few, you know, when the Internet 2.0 started really ramping up, Web 2.0, Hallmark had a, a subscription-based e-card service. And we, so did we. And it got, it got so nice to be able to send an e-card when you cared enough to send the very best. <laughs> When you forgot to go shopping for physical cards or stamps or whatever and, and mail it or you've just spaced out, oh, it's, it's too late. I'll be late if I mail it uh, postal service. So it would send an e-card. Well, about a year or so ago, they suspended that thing. I don't know what, why. Maybe they weren't making money, but <laughs> probably the case. And there are others, but uh, there are other e-card services, but... Uh, what it did, it prompted, uh, prompted me to actually uh, pay closer attention to my calendar and my uh, relatives' birthdays and anniversaries and so forth. And I decided I'm going to start sending physical cards again. And it kind of harkened me back to when my wife and I first got married. We would made custom cards. We made our own Christmas cards. I would design them and print them. Uh, and sometimes birthday cards, since it's just a one-off, I would hand-draw and create birthday cards for relatives and mail them off. So now I'm kind of doing an in-between. And I found, uh, I looked online, I was looking for a, a way that I could create my own card artwork and then get, get a one-off printed. And, and then if I get it to meet myself early enough, I could mail it, you know, regular snail mail. Well, in that search, I found this, this website called Postable, which does that uh, one better, in my opinion in that you can create custom one-time printed cards, but they'll actually mail them for you too. <laughs> and it's really reasonable. And they almost always have some kind of sale or coupon code that you can get 10, 15, 20% off. In fact, right now for holiday cards, they have this festive code. You can get 20% uh, off if you use that code. Now I created a, an account, so I'm just gonna go ahead and log in here and uh, see if my password will fill it for me. And I have started using this for cards to send custom artwork. So I can create artwork, because I've been doing that for 30 some years now in my career, <laughs> graphic design work. And I can upload my own artwork and uh, type in a message and they can mail it. But they also have, you know, pre, uh, pre-made cards so you can they have a whole stable of artists and designers who have come up with you know cards and they have holidays and birthdays and you have some where you can customize with your own photographs and uh, so forth you can change some of them you can change the messages certainly you can change the interior if you want a folded card you can have a folded card with a custom message inside that you type. It's not your own handwriting, but, you know, at least it's your thoughts. And um, you can put a, a custom back on it. You can put a photo on the back of it. They also sell flat cards that they mail in envelopes. So you just have a front and a back instead of a folded opening. And then they have postcards where you can just customize the front. 
And then on the back side, you can still have a message, and then that's where the postage is as well and where it's addressed. So you can, depending on what you want to spend and what you want to send, you, can, you have a lot of options here. So if I go back to, uh, just go back to my projects, I can just show you real quick. It doesn't seem to be, anyway, okay, so... Well, this is just another. You can you can browse this on your own. They got holiday cards. You can build your own. You can put stickers and draw on them. You got all kinds of things. But but uh, if you're mailing, having them mail them, you you can set up an address book. And I've just started a couple about a, two months ago, and so I have a few relatives in here, and I'm just adding them one at a time. You can upload your contacts, which I don't like doing. I don't want everybody in my contacts on this in on this website, but just my relatives one at a time. Can you I, upload a group, or does it have to be the entire contacts? Well, I didn't pursue it. I'm not sure which way. Uh, the question was, could you? Oh, you you have audio over there. So you. <laughs> anyway, um, but you can also schedule it. So if I go into um, go into somebody's. Uh, address here you can put their birth you, you can add their birthday to the contact on this website and then <coughs> when you create a card either at one of theirs or custom made and you you know go through the checkout and it, it ranges from like uh, about three bucks for a postcard to about six bucks i think for a folded card in an envelope so yeah, I thought it was really reasonable for mailing a custom-made card. It'll schedule it if it has a birthday associated with that uh, contact. It'll automatically schedule the mailing so that it arrives by that date. Now it's you know somewhat guess guessing based on postal service. So I usually schedule it for at least one day before the birthday, <laughs> which you can do. You can change the scheduling if you want to, but. Then I then it's it's great. I get a uh, a custom card sent to my friends and relatives uh, for their birthdays, anniversaries, and you can also order like packages. Like my wife and I are going to do a Christmas card this year. I can create a custom designed Christmas card, and I can order fifty of them and have them sit to me in a box, and then I can manually mail address and mail them, so uh, everybody gets the same one. How much is to use one of their pre made cards? How much um, is it? Let's just go. Let's say, uh, let's go to a holiday card here and just let's just pick a card. Well, let's just pick this one. <laughs> so flat cards are a dollar to three ninety nine. This is just a flat card, and that includes the postage. So each of them is a is a range. Let's go back. Uh, somewhere they have go back to snail mail heaven see if they have the somewhere there's a page where it shows oh, they'll do mass mailings as well so you can do a custom card and do a mass mailing maybe we'll do that instead of po posting it ourselves <laughs> let me log out and then i'll just show you here how it works you pick a card you personalize it and then you mail it so somewhere here there is a pricing thing but you can't answer that question right off that okay quickly. that's but, fine it's, I mean, the most expensive I think I've seen for a single card is, has been six bucks, six or seven dollars. That's better than Hallmark. Yeah, folded card <laughs> mailed for you. Um, so, yes, yeah, over 50 cents a, for an actual first class letter. Yeah, yeah, that includes postage. Anyway, so that's postable. And uh, look at it, see if it fits a need that uh, you might have. Let's see, where's that? Uh, definitely, I plan on taking a look at that. Because I'm notorious for not sending cards. I'll send emails. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Moving right along. Computer lexicon. Now we're getting into the real meat of the meeting, so to speak. By the way, just to let you know something that happened, when Barry decided to join my phone network, you notice I didn't have to give him a password. Well, you did. <laughs> I did not have to write it down and hand it to him. I didn't have to go over and type it in. Yeah, I, I didn't have to broadcast it. I needed a password. Yeah. He didn't have to like... What <laughs> happened was, with all the everything on the same computer network, when he asked to join, tried to join, on my iPad and on my phone, I got a dialog box that came up and said, do you want to share your password with him so he could log in? I said yes. It transmitted, encrypted the password to Barry. He never saw it, and he's on the network. So if you have a network at home, you can do that. If you have friends come over and want to use the, and they have a, a Mac, when they go to join your network, it will come up and say, do you want to let them join? If you say yes, it joins. They never see the password. And every time they come back, 
it'll automatically join. I still don't know what the password is for my daughter's network at her house. Went there the first time, we installed a network, came up and said, do you want to share it with me? And she said, yes. And ever since then, I go in there and share it. It's a, it's a real nice feature you don't often hear about. Okay, let's talk about our two terms this month are spam and phishing. What is spam? Spam, first and foremost, is unsolicited. That means you did not ask for it. This is different. Usually commercial messages, such as emails, text message, internet postings, mail in your mailbox, sent a large number of recipients or posted in large numbers of places. This is from Webster's definition. Best one I've found so far. Keyword here is unsolicited. Now, you can join a mailing list and get mailings. But in that case, you requested it, which means you can go up and unsubscribe to it. And we're going to be talking about unsubscribing. So hold your questions on that one. Any questions on what spam is? Just remember that unsolicited spam quite often is bogus. Don't trust it. Let's talk about phishing. Phishing, spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, is a practice of tricking internet users, that's us, through the use of deceptive email, messages, or websites, into revealing personal or confidential information. Examples, name, address, email address, social security number, bank routing information, credit card numbers, birth dates, anything about you. Pardon? Ma- oh, yes. The, um, which can then be used quite often. What they're doing is trying to get identity theft information. There was one I heard of a while back that I, I have to commend them for what they did. They established about six different sites. And you would get different emails from different companies. And each one of them would ask for different information. Putting it all together, it's called, I believe it's called collective intelligence, that separate, it's meaningless. All together, they were able to have a profile of you. And they were able to get phone numbers, mailing addresses, email addresses, credit card numbers, passwords. Very ingenious. A common phishing scam involves sending emails that appear to come from banks requesting recipients to verify their account by typing personal details, such as credit card information, into a website that has been disguised to look like the real thing. Such scams can be thought of as phishing for naive recipients. This is what we're going to be talking about today, how to identify this and what to do about it. Any questions on the definition? Today's presentation, Stopping the Cyber Bad Guys. Something that I found out about the past two days, there is now an organization which is setting setting up a counter uh, phishing. Their whole job is to go in, and you know, the list of telephone calls you get, the guy with a very distinct Indian accent that wants to sell you something, whole business is to break into these guys' network and steal back the money they've stolen from you. So far, they have recovered in one month over a million dollars from different people. One guy was $10,000. Some things to consider. Remember these. Memorize these. You did not. If you get, we're talking about email now, text messages. You did not win anything. You did not get a high dollar gift card for a survey. I will tell you, there are legitimate surveys that give $5 gift cards. I know because I get them all the time. But if you get an email message saying, you've just gotten a $100 gift card for finishing this survey, it's bogus. You did not inherit money from a Nigerian prince. Got news for you. Didn't happen. This one is very, have a friend stuck in Heathrow Airport. 20 years ago, I was sitting at home, playing on my computer, and I get an email message through Facebook from a very dear friend of mine. I am stuck in Heathrow. Please help me. I need $100. So I can get food and a place to stay. Can you help me? I thought, I said, hold it. You know, was not surprised that she'd asked me. I was surprised that I had no idea she was traveling out of the country. I went and emailed her, not through Facebook, regular email. Within 20 minutes, I got a call. What are you talking about? I'm not in London. This was the first time I'd ever seen a Facebook scam. That is the most notorious one of all. The Heathrow Airport. Here it's more likely I'm stuck in Mexico. I have not seen that one. Okay. A friend of mine uh, that I used to work with, uh, he actually got one contacted from supposedly a friend of his. And they actually scraped uh, Facebook. They got enough details about the guy that they were actually able to sound uh, convincing. And of course, yeah, he then directly called up his friend and said, seriously, are you? He said, no. <laughs> oh, by the way, Facebook messages, be very suspect. 
If you get a message from somebody you have not heard from in a long time, it is probably not them. Owe money for something you did not buy. Norton subscriptions for $311.57. Bogus. If you did not order it, it don't work. Now, most of the time what you're going to get is messages from a company saying, you need to renew your subscription. Please visit our website. And I'll show you how to make sure that you know where you're going. But you'll not get one saying, you owe this much money. The last bullet, I want everyone to memorize. It is a mantra. You will be quizzed on this. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Okay. One thing, on my phone, I have it set up a whitelist, which means that if you're not on my contact list, it goes straight to voicemail. I just got one yesterday, and <laughs> it said that it came from Bisbee, from a local number, and I actually got a voicemail, which is unusual. And I listened to it, and it was one minute of, we're going to make it easy for you to pay off your student loan. <laughs> yeah. And it went on for one minute about paying off my student loan. And at the end, it actually said, I'll wait until you're done here. I don't want you to spray the screen. At the end, it said, oh, by the way, if you don't have a student loan, then just disregard this message. <laughs> I, I got one of those. The first one I got was like about 10 years ago. I've had my student loan paid off for years. So I called them because they said, you're default on your student loan. So I called them. I said, but I don't have a student loan. Oh, well, just disregard this. Okay, here is a major topic. Most of you have seen the subscribe to mailing list, and you'll see an email message where it says you can unsubscribe to it. Here is the question, to unsubscribe or not? That is a very good question. These are my opinions on the subject. These are not gospel. They're not edicts. They're not court orders. It's my opinion. If you join the mail list, you can unsubscribe with no problem. Like our mail list, if you want to unsubscribe, we don't sell our mail list to anybody. I don't even know who's on the mail list. If you did not subscribe to the mail list, this is where it gets interesting. If you recognize a company as one you frequent, then yes. So if you see that the mail list come in, I get them from, um, it's a clothing, famous online clothing. I, um, I can't remember the name of it right now. But I get the mailings from them all the time. I don't ever remember. My wife is probably the one who subscribed to it. Yeah. Now, this is the important part. If you do not recognize the company, then do not unsubscribe. Because this is what happens. They sell, they gather, there are people out there that gather email addresses and sell them to companies to send out bulk mailing. If you unsubscribe, that tells them you exist. This is a good email address. They'll turn around and sell it as a verified email address. Because a lot of them, they go and they'll farming. They'll farm email addresses. That's why you never want to forward a message with email addresses in it. Because at some point, it's going to get to somebody who's going to take and copy those and sell e email lists. And it's pretty good money in that. What happens is if you do not respond, do not visit the website, eventually you'll be taken off that list. So if you don't recognize them, don't unsubscribe. I tried this once to make sure that so I went and unsubscribed. Within three days, I went from getting about bogus emails, email lists, to over a thousand. Yeah, and it's taken me, I still get about 300 bogus emails a day. Any questions on that? That is the mantra. That's your second mantra. Don't unsubscribe unless you know the company. We're going to talk about spam. First one, Barry's got, Um, let's see, what's my, my, ne my next? Okay, we're going to talk about text messages. I talk about the, the um, Publishers Clearing House talk about that one right now you'll get a phone call or it actually starts off with a text message informing you that you have won publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes is a legitimate they really do exist they really give out money however they do not contact you prior they will come to your home ring the bell and keep coming back until you answer they do not contact you via text message they do not contact you via email in some cases if they've made eight or nine visits, they will send a registered letter to the Postal Department. Other than that, and you always win Publishers Clearinghouse, you always win money. You do not get a new brand, brand new BMW. We have a member who got involved with this scam. Fortunately, she called me because what they're trying to do is to get you to write them a, a cashier's check for $600 to cover the taxes on the new BMW, and people fall for it. We're going to talk about wrong text number scam, fake surveys. The wrong text number scam, I'll cover that one because I don't think I have a, a um, slide on that one. 
you'll get a text message from somebody saying, hi, I'll just use, hi, Sarah, how are you doing? Hi, Joe, how are you doing? That's not who I am. And I write back and say, I'm afraid you have the wrong number. They will start a conversation up with you. And this can go on for quite a while. And they'll be at some point, they'll try and get personal information out of you. So be very leery. The most notorious on this one is they go after men. And these are porn girls trying to get you to visit their porn sites. I used to get these like three or four a day. I couldn't understand where were they getting my phone number from? Then I realized that on my Facebook account, my phone number was listed. I've totally forgotten about that. As soon as I took that off my Facebook account, I've got one since then. What they're doing now is they're using auto dialers. They'll put it in an area code and a prefix. And it'll just generate message after message after message waiting for a response to come back. So here's the mantra. If it's too good to be true, it's fake. Text messages. Well, let's take a look at this text message. It's from a number I don't recognize because you notice up at the, uh, the top that it shows. I'm going to see. Come on, come on. Give it to me. That's not my contact, so I don't know them. Look at the wording. That's not good English. Great, Noti, you were just selected to test to keep a TV 82 inch. You get to keep it. Wow, okay, but look at what kind of URL is that? It's no company I know. Here's another one. Your closest low delivered a Noti to your device. I have no idea. These are honest to goodness text messages. Okay, these are taken off my phone. Bogus phone number. Bogus phone number. Terrible English. Terrible English. It's a good indication they're bogus. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. You can get up to a 100-inch TV set now. Um, not easily, but you can get them. Those are designed for small movie theaters. They're not commercially available yet for the general public. I have seen them. The definition is phenomenal. Okay, let's take a look at some more. Um, once again, phone number. Now, this is second and last something. We will block your gadget promptly. Please clean up spam messages. Scan instantly. When this one came in, I was laughing so hard. I was in tears. Yes, you go to that site. You have to create a login to get there. If you are on a Windows or an Android phone, listen carefully. These type of text messages can actually read your device once you get that website. On the iPhone and the Mac, they cannot. So, Mac and iPhone, if you want to visit the site and take a look at it, on a text message, chances are you're going to be okay. You may end up getting a web-based um, malware. Androids and Windows, it can be devastating. A friend of mine who's got an Android phone, didn't follow my advice. She went up to it, and it showed them downloading her contacts. And she she called me, and she says, is this normal? No. Okay. Barry, you, whenever you feel like... Mike, I have uh, my phone settings for what he mentioned as a, as a white one, which in, uh, in the iPhone settings app, scroll to the phone, you can scroll down and there's this silence unknown callers item. That means if the phone call that's coming in is from a, someone that's not in your contact, then it will not ring. It'll go immediately, it'll push it immediately to voicemail. That's what he means by a whitelist. So the only calls you'll be able to receive are people that you know, that you, that you have manually put into your contact. And if they leave a voicemail message, which is often not the case, as Mike said, it's unusual for these scamming ones to leave a voicemail, but you'll also get a notification that you have a voicemail once there's a voicemail there. So I figure if it's a legitimate person trying to get a hold of me that I don't know or haven't put into my contact, they will leave a message and then I can call them back. But if it's a like one of these scam things, then I don't even get I don't even get the phone to ring and I don't it's I'm not interrupted by something that's trying to take advantage of me or just wasting my time. I strongly <laughs> recommend that if you have an iPhone, you turn that on. Yeah. It's oh yeah, it's just okay. So if if I'm on the home screen and you're gonna open the settings. And then you want to, you know, scroll your list until you find the section of apps to the, where you find the phone app. And then go into the phone app setting and then scroll down again. And it's in the third from the bottom group from the bottom, uh, Silence Unknown Callers. And it's just an on-off switch. And uh, it has a little explanation about how it works there if you have more questions about it. And that's the first thing I do having to do with phone calls. But with text messages, well, actually, I do I have a... a a tip that I got years ago, phone 
blocking my camera there, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, there was a, there was a uh, publication called Macworld, and there was a writer called Chris Breen, who now works for Apple, probably in the marketing department because he was a writer, but uh, we don't hear from him anymore because he's behind the Apple silence wall. <laughs> But when he worked for Mac World Magazine, he wrote a column called 911 Mac. Somebody else has taken it over now. But one of the tips that he shared in that column years and years and years ago, was early in the iPhone era, was how he dealt with spam calls. And it was before this feature where you could turn off the, turn off the thing. Um, there is a way of blocking callers. It always has been a way of blocking a number. And you can do that on an individual contact basis. But what he, what he did, and I just followed his example, he created a contact specifically for this and named it Sir Spamalot, which I, I just did it. I even made my custom, custom little uh, contact icon for it. <laughs> and, and then anytime he got... A, a spam call or text message. He just added it to this particular contact, and and you can see over the years I have hundreds of numbers in here. But at the very bottom of the contact, there is a. Um, it, it's already it's already set up this way. But you can you, you can block this caller. I think you have to go into edit mode to see it. Um, <laughs> It's just got so many stuff and things in it. It just keeps scrolling. I don't know why it auto-scrolls. Anyway, if it, it's already blocked, but if it wasn't blocked, it would have it would have a an item called block this caller. So if I go to another if I go to another person um, that it's not blocked, not a block this caller. Maybe I still have to go to edit. I wonder if they've taken that out. I don't see that block this caller button anymore. Oh, okay. Anyway, so that's that was what I was doing up until fairly recently. Was anytime I'd get a text message or uh, a phone call like this, and, and and the ones that are now silenced, they still show up in my recents list. So every now and then I'll go into my recents and go in and add it to my spam a lot. So here's a here's an unknown call. Who it's from? Yeah. See, there's a block this caller for that one, but. If I I can add to an existing contact since I've already set it up and I go sir spam a lot oops not sit I can it'll add it to the bottom of the list yeah I created that um, so and then if I update that contact now that recent shows up as sir spam a lot <laughs> now in messages uh, here's here's an example of one of those ones that uh, John was just talking about where did it go here oh this is a text a text message from some unknown number thinking my name is Hitchcock <laughs> James is trying to get a hold of Hitchcock from <laughs> Anyway, uh, I think this is Iowa 16. I'm not sure I remember seeing it in um, before this, but now you'll notice underneath the message, the sender is not in your contact list, is a button for report junk. What this does when you tap that, it'll send a report to Apple, who I then I think passes these on. Um, but it'll also delete this message out of your message. No, yeah, it's just iOS 16 is when this came into effect. And we'll talk about when it gets Yeah, so uh, I've started doing that instead of going through all the gyrations of adding them to a blocked content. So now it's more, more I just tap on that one button and then they go away and they get reported. And because when I do for spam a lot, it, you know, it blocks it for me, but it doesn't report as a spam spam bot. So anyway, so that's that's my little tips about how I handle these these kinds of things and those examples of phishing. You have two different types of phishing. You have and businesses and the people will seem to be people you know sending you anytime you get an email asking you for something. The name may be right. But look at the email address. We're going to take a look at that in the upcoming video. Don't go by the name alone. Go by the actual email address to see if it's from them. Same with businesses. Websites. Look at the URL. And I'm going to show you some examples that are really well done. Fake surveys. Be very careful when taking surveys. There are some legitimate surveys out there. But if you go up to a survey and they ask you right up front for personal information, be leery of it. Now... A legitimate survey waits until you're finally done and saying, would you like to be entered into a drawing for X? 
And it's normally a five or ten dollar. Sometimes it's a hundred dollar gift card. And the one with a hundred dollar gift card, I know it's legit. It's Barclays Bank. I get them. It, Barclays is the one. It's from them. It's their URL. And I actually want a hundred dollar gift card from them. I couldn't believe it. All of a sudden, the mail I get this you no, know, an email message saying you've won a hundred dollar gift card. And I looked at the email address and it said, okay, it's from Barclays Bank. So it went up. I followed the link and it took me to a legitimate Amazon gift card site, and it was a $100 gift card. But I was very leery of it. Okay, fake giveaways. They'll do anything to get your information. Anytime you see one of these, and if you follow it, and they start to ask you for information, especially money to get a prize, it's not legit. In some states, Arizona is not one of them, that if you win an automobile as part of a drawing, before you can get the automobile, you have to pay the state tax. It will not be a check ma made out to whomever. It will, if you do write a check, it will be to the Depart the Arizona Department of Revenue is who it goes to, a specific form. Arizona is not one of those. In Arizona, you pay the tax after you get the car, not before. In some states, it's before. Unidentified phone calls. Phone calls asking for information, like student debt. What they're doing is trying to find people who have a student debt, so you'll take a high-interest loan out from them. How to identify phishing. First off, if it's an email message or it's a phone call, look to see who it's from. If the text message is supposedly from somebody you deal business with or somebody you know, but the phone number is not in your contacts, email address, and we'll show you how to look at the actual email address. The URL for the site. If you get an email message allegedly from Amazon to go visit a site and the URL taking you to that site is not Amazon.com, it's probably not legit. Asking you for unnecessary information such as credit card numbers. One of my best ones is FedEx. You have received a package in which you owe money on. You follow the link and ask for a credit card. I almost fell for that one because I had a FedEx package that had duty do on it. So that's what I thought I'd gotten. And I went up to the site and I noticed there was something odd about the site. I couldn't put my finger on it. And then I looked at the URL. So I'm like, oh, this is not FedEx. Don't give out your bank routing. Anytime anybody asks me for bank routing, I that raises the flag with me. Because once you do that, they can go in and take every cent you own and you can't stop them. And the bank does not cover it. Credit cards, they will. Bank routing information, they don't. Uh, probably want to update that also with the cash apps then. Like I understand Zelle, which is a cash app that is uh, was created by a consortium of banks. It also does not have any of the protections of a credit card. So if you are using Zelle and you accidentally send money to someone that other than you intend, it's gone. Yes. And the banks will not help you. That's a problem with Zelle. And if you don't do business with somebody who says that you've done something, it's probably phishing. Now, how to identify fake email? I got a video on this one. In this video, we are going to look at how to determine if an email is legitimate or if the email is spam or phishing for information. There are three steps. First, we look at the from addressee. Does it match the body of the email? That is, if the email is from Walmart, but the return address is from something completely different, that should raise a flag. In this example, the body of the email does not seem to specify any organization, and the return address is from a PC magazine in the United Kingdom. This alone should raise a flag that this email is not legitimate. The chances are that this email is spam, but let's continue. Step two, we next look at the to addressee. If it is not you, then definitely it's spam or phishing. In this case, it is, so we continue. The last step is to look at the body of the email. Is the language correct English? Is the product or organization one that you are using or doing business with? If there is a link in the body of the email, there is a trick you can do in iOS. You can preview the site without actually going to the site. This is a safe procedure. Long click on the URL in the message. This shows the URL. In this case, it is nonsense. So almost for sure it's spam or phishing. We can tap the URL window and it'll open a preview of the site. And we can see if most likely a phishing expedition making a claim to get compensation for a possible legitimate endeavor. The email is not legit. Delete the email. Now we're going to take a look at another example and go through all the steps. Um, got this email coming in. It says answer when a brand new Apple Watch. It says it's from the Postal Service. So let's check the uh, 
from Lai Address He. And as you can see, that is not the Postal Department. ArcConsoleCommands.com. Okay, the subject is just a number. I have no idea what that means. Let's take a look and see. Yep, it's sent to me. The reply to makes absolute sense. And we can come down and check. And it's uh, ArcConsoleCommands.com. I have no idea who that is. And it's bogus letters up here. We've got a URL here. I'm going to check the URL. And it brings me up a preview. And it's omachupeng.com. No idea who it is. It says United States Mail Survey. I don't think so. This looks pretty bogus to me. And there's, you know, bogus emails from people being verified by who say what. Um, I don't think this is legit. And so they want in the unsubscribe by clicking here. Let's see, get a preview of what that does. Uh, submit your email address. It, it looks you know, a very good job of looking legit. However, I really don't think so. There's nothing about this to show that it's legitimate. So I'm going to trash it. And for our last example, we're going to take a look at uh, one last one. And this is an email that came in. It says, you know, it's from Disney gift card. But we take a look at the address. It's from DisneyGiftCard.com. That could be actually pretty legitimate. Let's see what they're asking for. Uh, it's got a very nice subject. It is to my daughter. And yes, it's to her address, all right. We take a look at the URL, and it's Disney. It's the same outfit it says they are. And we're we'll see what are they, they're not asking, they're asking us to shop for a gift card. So let's take a look at shopdisney.com. I know that is a legitimate Disney site. So I think this one is a legitimate because it's asking me, I don't have to sign in, but it's allowing me to if I want to. And so let's go to sign in and see what it shows. Disney account, shop Disney. Let's just double check it. Shop, yep, this looks like a legitimate for gift cards. Let's take a look at some websites. Um, this, by the way, is extremely common on Android phones. Not so much on iPhone. Attention, viruses found. Your phone is severely damaged by 39 viruses. Soon your phone's SIM card will be corrupted. It'll be damaged. Your contacts, photos, data, blah, 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 blah. No, don't work that way. Um, you notice the, uh, here's the message, allegedly from McAfee. But notice that the URL down at the bottom says Pufora.com. That's not McAfee. What they want you to do is to spend $495 to fix the viruses on your phone. The fixing process to download all the information off your Android phone. Can't happen on iPhone. iOS will not let you do that. Here's another one. U.S. Postal Service. This one looks pretty good, except, as a reminder, it informs you that your shipment, which is nothing like a postal number, is still pending instructions from you. Confirm the payment. The second delivery cost is... Notice the 299 USD. They use a European comma instead of the U.S. decimal point. Center is spelt with the English. Please do not reply to this email to get in touch with us. Click help and contact. Notice copyright 1999-2022 U.S lowercase ps inc all rights reserved located at 2211 north first street san jose california this number right here almost is a postal number almost and by the way 2211 north first street san jose is a post office i went and checked it out out of curiosity not legitimate good start but you need to look and see what you're getting this is the most important slide of the presentation and i'm actually going to Finish right on time. What happens if you get bogus emails? First thing you do is you for if it's a company you do business with and you determine it's bogus, forward that email to fraud at with the company name. They're, 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 you have to look it up. Like American Express, it's fraud at AmericanExpress.com. Chase, it's fraud at Chase.com. Wells Fargo, it's all fraud at. They will take that and if it asks you to include anything, include everything. They will take that and use the routing information, which you normally can't see, to find out where it came from. This is new as of this morning. There is now a government agency that has been formed to handle this nonsense. It's USA.gov. Ah, there it is. This is where you report it. Where to report scams? COVID, oh, COVID-19 scams are running rampant. Identity theft, imposter scams, unemployment scams. There is now a government website that you can go to and report them. It is part of the Federal Trade Commission. FTC used to have a section on their website. They now have an entire 
page devoted to it. Yeah, Tony? .gov. That tells you immediately it's government. No one else is allowed to use that domain. That's the best way to find out by looking at the domain. Uh, it, it could be anything before the .gov, and it'll be a government website. Arizona.gov. Actually, with Arizona, it's something.az.gov. California, it's .ca.gov. .gov, you know, is good. That is a domain that is restricted. You have to be a government agency in order to use it. It is very tightly controlled, and you can't break into I mean, there's no way to break into it. It's like buno.us. That is my domain. You cannot use that, um, that domain without my explicit permission. And believe me, I've had phishing trying to get use of it. Can't happen. .gov, for sure, that's how you know it's good. If you do not see the .gov and they're pretending to be a government agency, especially if it's supposed to be from the IRS asking you for money. IRS does not send email messages. Yes. Dot, technically, if they try and do a .gov.com, it'll be stopped before it ever gets to you. So that's who you report it to. What happened to my presentation? Use that link. And in the description, I'll have that link actually published for you. Any questions or discussion on anything we've talked about? Questions or discussion? With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. Not bad timing. Within 10 minutes. You all take care and everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>